Hello everyone and welcome back. So we have now learned an additional technique to help us to calculate definite integrals. Previously, we had five main methods that we were using, three methods that could be used to get exact values, two methods that could be used to get estimates, and now we have a sixth method that can be used to calculate definite integrals exactly. This method of using the fundamental theorem of calculus, of finding an antiderivative, plugging the limits into the antiderivative, and then subtracting. Now, yesterday in our drill set, I gave you a bunch of problems and I told you, I want you to use the fundamental theorem on all of these problems. But the difference between yesterday's problem set and today's problem set is that in today's problem set, I'm going to give you a mixture of a variety of integrals. And once again, it will be up to you to decide what method is most effectively used to calculate the integral that I have given you. Now, students generally agree that what we're dealing with right here, this kind of thing, is what makes Calculus 2 particularly challenging. And this is really sort of your first class where there are a lot of different methods on the table to solve any particular problem. This is really your first math class where a big part of the work is simply deciding what method to use. So once again, let's pause for a minute and let's simply talk through my thought process and my reasoning when I go to choose a method to evaluate a definite integral and hopefully my sharing my process um, of how to choose a method will help you to choose a method as well. As a matter of fact, I went ahead and created a little flow chart. Um, to just capture sort of the things that I think about and the things that I look at um, as I am going to calculate a definite integral um, and how I tend to decide what method I'm going to use. So I start out and I have a problem and the very first thing that I ask myself is, am I calculating a definite integral that um, I have opposite limits and I have odd symmetry? Um, I love it when this is true, because when this is true, if this is a yes, if the answer to this question is yes, um, then the odd function rule tells me right away that the uh, value of that definite integral is zero. So that's the very first thing that I check, because if this is true, it'll you know end the question right away. Now suppose that I'm unlucky and I am not able to use the odd function rule for my definite integral. The next thing that I check is, can I find an antiderivative of the function that I'm integrated, integrating very, very easily? If I can easily find an antiderivative, um, then I will go ahead and use the fundamental theorem in that case, um, because all three steps of the fundamental theorem will be easy if this is true. Now suppose that I don't have odd uh, function rule at play, and suppose that the antiderivative of the function is something that's not really easy to find. The next thing that I'm looking at is the graph of the function, and I'm looking at geometry. Is the area under the curve, is the net area something that I can find um, using a standard geometric formula, like for a triangle, rectangle, trapezoid, circle, that kind of thing? If it is possible for me to find the area under the curve using geometry, then I will typically go with a net area calculation um, to find that definite integral, because this will get me an exact value um, pretty quickly. Okay, so now I'm in the situation of, all right, I, I, I couldn't use odd function rule. I didn't have a super easy antiderivative. I couldn't get the net area exactly using geometric formulas. If all these things have failed, the next thing that I'm looking at is, can I find any antiderivative for this function at all using the rules and techniques that I know so far? If I can find any antiderivative at all at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and use fundamental theorem. I'm gonna go ahead and use fundamental theorem in that situation and just plug those limits into the antiderivative that I can find. Now, suppose that I'm working with a function where it's very difficult for me to find an antiderivative, or maybe it's just impossible for me to find an antiderivative at all. 
if I am unable to find an antiderivative, the next thing I'm asking myself is, okay, is my integral something that I can split into simpler integrals? Um, for example, if I use the pit stop rule, can I split my integral into a couple of simpler pieces? If I can split my integral into simpler pieces, then I ask myself all of these questions again um, about each piece of the integral. Does the pieces of that split up integral have odd symmetry? Do the pieces have easy antiderivatives? Do the pieces have easy areas under the curve? Um, can I find any antiderivative of the pieces? Um, if I can split the integral into pieces, then I ask these questions again of every single piece. And if I cannot split the integral into simpler pieces, now I am kind of out of um, exact calculation methods, and I'm starting to look at estimate methods. If I have only the graph of the function that I'm trying to integrate, then I would do an estimate by square counting, um, just estimating the net area. And in any other situation, sort of my last resort method is to estimate using a Riemann sum. Um, a Riemann sub method is what I would do if I answered no to all of these questions earlier. So there's the flow chart explaining my reasoning, and let me show you what that reasoning looks like in action with a couple of um, exercises. So for example here, exercise A, I'm asked to integrate from three, negative 3 to positive 3 um, t cubed. Right away I see we have opposite limits, Right away, I see we have an odd integrand, so 100% I'm using odd function rule here. The answer is zero. Done. Now, if I had the same integrand of t cubed, but my limits were not opposites, then I am no longer able to use the odd function rule. But I do see that my integrand t to the third power is something where it would be very easy to find an antiderivative just using power rule. So in this case, I would use the fundamental theorem to calculate this definite integral. I would find that antiderivative plug in the two limits of integration, and then subtract. That's what I would do here. OK, part C. How would I approach an integral that looks like this one? I'm seeing that my limits are not opposites, so I cannot use no, um, I cannot use any odd function rule here. Um, looking at this function, um, because I have an absolute value in this function, um, I recognize this as something that I do not have an antiderivative rule for. So because I cannot, you know, find an antiderivative easily, the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the graph of this function, and I'm going to see if its graph has any nice geometry to it. So here is the graph of the function that I'm integrating, the absolute value of x minus 3, graphed from x equals minus 1 on the left to positive 4 on the right. And I can see that the area underneath this curve um, consists of two triangles. There's a small triangle here on the right side and also this small triangle here on the left side. So because the area under this curve um, consists of two triangles, then I could find the area of each triangle using a geometry formula and put those together, and that would be the value of my definite integral. So I would absolutely be using geometry there. What about this one? Similar uh, idea, but instead of having the absolute value around x minus 3, this time I have x minus 3 quantity squared. Now again, on function rule is not at play. Um, and looking at this function, um, it may not be super easy, um, just like it might not be as easy as this one to find an antiderivative. But if I look at the graph of this function, the graph of this function, x minus 3 squared, 
um, I can see that the area underneath this curve um, is not a standard geometric shape for which I have a geometry formula. So this is a moment where I'm asking myself, OK, is there any antiderivative for this function that I can find? Um, because if I can find any antiderivative for this function, I'm probably going to go ahead and use fundamental theorem of calculus. No odd symmetry. Now, at the moment, it doesn't seem like this is an expression to which I can apply the rules of integration that I have learned so far. However, if I simplify this integrand by expanding what's in those parentheses, I can see that the thing that I'm integrating is equivalent to x squared minus 6x plus 9. Um, and I can find the antiderivative of this expression um, using just power rule and sum rule, and difference rule, and constant multiple rule. So because I can find an antiderivative for this function, um, at this point I would absolutely be using fundamental theorem to uh, find the value of this particular integral. OK, now what about this function here? Integral from minus 1 to positive 3 of f of x, where f of x is given by this piecewise function. Now looking at this piecewise function, you know, piecewise functions, um, we have no antiderivative formulas for piecewise functions. Um, the odd function rule does not apply here. Um, I suspect that geometry is not going to apply here because this x squared term is going to give us uh, a region with a curved top. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to split this complicated integral into three portions using pit stop rule. I'm going to integrate the first function um, in the piecewise expression um, over this first interval of x's from minus 1 to 1. I am going to integrate from 0 to 2 this second piece, um, 2x squared. I am going to integrate from 2 to 3 this final piece, 4 dx. And now I'm going to see um, how would I approach calculating each of these integrals quickly. Now each of these sort of separate integrals, um, the, the function that I'm integrating at this point is really nice, just polynomials. So each of these three integrals can be found easily using fundamental theorem, um, because each of these functions, 1 plus x, um, 2x squared and 4 has a really simple antiderivative just by power rule. So applying power rule and fundamental theorem, I would calculate the value of each of these three pieces, and then I would just add the results together to get the total um, integral from minus 1 to 3 of this piecewise function. What about this guy here, integrating from 2 to 4 the function f of x dx, where the function f of x is not described at all using a formula, it's simply described using a table. Now as soon as you see a table of data for your function, you're basically um, funneled right away into having to do a Riemann sum estimate. Because, you know, if you're just given a table of data, then all of these checks in the flowchart uh, fail right away. Um, if you just have a table of data, you don't have enough information to determine if there's odd symmetry. If you just have a table of data, you don't have enough information to find an antiderivative. If you just have a table of data, you don't have enough information to determine the shape of the region under the graph. 
So um, all of these checks fail. And if you're given a table of data, you're automatically working down here, um, doing an estimate by a Riemann sum. So that's what I would do because that's what I would have to do in a situation like this one. Finally, let's consider this scenario. I'm asked to integrate from zero to three, the square root of one plus x cubed. Now, first thing that I'm checking is odd function rule. Well, odd function rule is out because my limits of integration are not options, not opposites. The next thing I'm checking, is there any geometry that I can exploit in this graph? So off I go to Desmos and I'm integrating the function one plus x cubed. And I'm checking to see what that graph looks like between the limits of zero and three. Um, but alas, because of this sort of curved top, the region under the graph doesn't have a nice geometry formula that we can use. Is there a really simple antiderivative that I can see right away? And the answer, unfortunately, is no. We do not have any integral rules that apply to an expression like this one, where there's something, you know, quite complicated underneath a square root. Can I split this function up into a couple of simpler pieces, like I did with that piecewise function earlier? No, I cannot. So now I'm checking to see, okay, is there, there wasn't a simple antiderivative. Is there any antiderivative at all for this function that I can come up with? Unfortunately, this expression cannot be simplified. And it, since it cannot be simplified to look like something for which I have an antiderivative rule, um, I would not in this situation be able to come up with any antiderivative at all. So fundamental theorem at the fundamental theorem at this point is completely out um, because this function is too complicated for me to be able to come up with an antiderivative. So at this point, I am completely um, out of methods um, by which I can calculate the exact value of this integral. At this point, for at this point, I am forced um, into an estimate. And I have a choice, am I going to do a net area estimate by counting squares, or am I going to do a Riemann sum estimate um, using a table? Um, my preference, as I've told you before, in a situation like this, is to use a Riemann sum um, over a counting squares estimate. And that's simply because I feel like I have a little bit more control over the Riemann sum um, because I can sort of control the amount of accuracy by controlling um, the size of the delta t, or in, in our case, delta x, that I am using in my Riemann sum calculation. Whereas the counting squares method, um, sort of no matter what you do, is always going to give you a really rough estimate. So I feel like I have less control over the square counting method. And the square counting method is the only something that I would use if I was given um, only the function's graph and I was not given its formula. Okay, so this summarizes um, the reasoning that I would use in each of these six examples. Hopefully sharing that with you is helpful.